So Ken asked me to speak quite a while ago um, today, and then like as he's doing it, he's like, "Oh, it's Mother's Day." He really likes Mother's Day and Father's Day, and uh, and I was like, "No, I got it, man. It's okay." And then on Monday this week, I realized that we have the Leadercast event, you know, coming on Friday, and and uh, I, I'm in my finals week uh, for college, uh, not my final final, but finals regardless, and, um, and my wife left on Thursday. She didn't leave me, um, <laughs> but she, she, went to, she went to Ohio uh, to visit family that she hasn't seen in a decade, um, and so I'm really excited. She hasn't been on, no, it's actually over a decade. 2002 was the last time she saw them. She hasn't been a pl- on a plane in a decade. I'm like, man, where have you been? Like, planes are cool. Not for tall people, but, like, I can imagine for her being a short person, it'd be cooler. Um... <laughs> and so I told Ken about all this and I'm like I just don't know if I can speak on Sunday and he's like no don't worry about it man I'll, I'll cancel my plans I'm staying well then apparently that night he got in a fight uh, with his lovely mother not his mother but his mom his wife 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 got in a fight with his wife but it wasn't a fight but she's like what am I chopped liver you know and uh, he's like so Brian um, you and Josh are both going to speak because then in a shorter amount of time, we can both share uh, about our mothers. And uh, I was like, yeah, I can, I can do that. I'm excited. And then I realized as I'm preparing that I haven't really shared much of my story about my mother with, with y'all. And so I'd like to share my story about my mother with you. Um, we noticed, both Josh and I, uh, some tears, okay, uh, when... when Sons talk about their mother, we might get a little emotional. And so as I tell my wife, DWI, deal with it. <laughs> um, so let me start at the beginning. I was born in Bozeman, Montana at Bozeman Deaconess Hospital. Uh, my dad was in Billings at the time. Uh, my parents were not married. Uh, and my dad was in Billings to be a, uh, going to school to be a doctor. And uh, he showed up like the next day after I was born actually got kicked out of the hospital, but uh, about a year later, they, they were married, and uh, my dad, again, Bozeman, if you don't know where it's at, it's three hours that way. Um, my dad joined the Air Force so he could see the world and raise a family, and they'd stationed him in Great Falls, Montana. <laughs> while here, um, my dad has always known his whole life that he was allergic to bees, but while here, he was at Holter Lake, and, you know, they're playing and whatever in the water, and, and uh, he got sung by a bee, as he was jumping into the water to escape said bee, and the water at Holter is cold, he got what's called cold urticaria. Um, layman's terms, he became allergic to the cold. Um, it's a real thing. You can Google it now, later, whenever you want. Um, but it's a real thing. He would, he would uh, wh- where we lived on Mousham was the cinder block on-base housing. Um, and so he'd go out and shovel the sidewalk and come in and look like a bulldog. Like it all swollen up and, and a little red. And I, I remember one time just him rubbing some ice on his arm for a couple seconds, and it, it, it swole up. It was itchy. It was red. And, and so we had to move. He got, he got medically discharged, and, uh, and we had to move. So we moved to Aiken, South Carolina. And, and to kind of put you guys on the map, I forgot to do this last service. To put you on the map, Augusta, Georgia is where the Masters is held. This is about a half an hour north from, from Augusta where the Masters are held. It's about where we were at. Uh, he worked for a company. Uh, during that time, my mother uh, got, got her degree in accounting, uh, went to school and, and got that. And she, she was doing some medical transcribing and some different things, you know, uh, there. And uh, this is when I met my first stepmom. <laughs> my parents got a divorce uh, when I was about 13. Uh, at 13 years old, at least in the state of Georgia, I think it's the same in Montana, kind of nationwide. At, at 13, you can decide which parent. The kid gets to decide, or at least have some good input. Um, be- before that, you know, you don't really get to de- decide where you go. So at 13, my dad's got a bass boat, right? <laughs> uh, he had just moved uh, into this kind of gated community bachelor pad that had, like, a pool and hot tub and workout room, like, you know, that you, you, you share. And I'm like, duh. <laughs> I'm living with dad. It had nothing to do with, like, loving someone more or wanting to be with this person. I wanted to fish, swim in the pool, and there might have been a cute girl that lived close to my dad. And so I, I chose dad. And I remember 
at 102 Poplar Place, where I was living in Aiken, South Carolina, the, I remember the discussion with my dad in the garage. I remember our garage. Like, like some of these moments in your life are so vivid, right? Um, and so I, I remember looking at my dad and saying, coming with you, man. We're going to be bachelors together. We're going to go fishing. It's going to be awesome. And uh, so I left him in the garage, and my mom went out to talk to him. They, you know, they, they, they weren't fighting all the time. You could tell there's tension, you know. But anyway, she went out to talk to him. I, I probably went in, my brother's back over here, I probably went in and was like, I'm going dad, you know, and, and did whatever. And then my mom had, had to share with me that my dad didn't want me. Um, my dad's conversation with her was, uh, I don't know how we're going to work this out, but he's not coming with me. Like, he, he's going with you. I, tell him I don't want to split up the family or something, you know. <laughs> so I'm like, you don't want to split up the family? Getting a divorce, like that's splitting up the family, you hypocrite. But uh, that, that's, that's my story on my dad. And uh, so, so my mom had to, to comfort me in that situation and, and, and was beautiful at it. Watched her go through the divorce, and there was definitely some hard moments, but, but we decided, uh, she decided to move us back to Montana. Uh, so we, we came back to Bozeman. In Bozeman, uh, you know, we bounced a few houses, but as a single mom with, with just some child support and alimony, uh, she was able to uh, buy us a home. It was a modular home, but it was awesome. 804 Golden West Drive, right? And, and it was cool. In, in Belgrade, Montana, it was this new uh, modular home that, that was just great. And uh, so we, we moved there, and then uh, in high school, I find my wife, and we kind of followed the same footsteps as my parents. I was not... Married when I had my first child, uh, Caden. When he hears about this, this is my favorite part to share. When he hears, you know, that he was at our wedding, he was about a month old, um, right before I deployed or we left for the military. Uh, he says, "Well, that makes me like Jesus, right?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Dude, I mean, I pray that you are like Jesus, but no, <laughs> that makes that makes me a sinner." <laughs> And so uh, I find my wife, Lindsay, and, and we move uh, to Georgia. I take her, this Montana gal that's never been anywhere ever, and take her down to Aiken, South Carolina, driving with, with a brand newborn, and I leave her because we go to Iraq. Uh, within, within weeks, actually, it wasn't even a full month from, from getting down to Aiken, South, South Carolina, I was deployed to Iraq in 2003. Um, and then I come back, and, and in between deployments, we, there's tons of training. And so lots of lots of training, and, and then another deployment for a total of 19 months, and then um, lots of training again, getting ready to deploy for the third time. And, and, and leading up to this uh, third deployment, they found that I had too much hearing loss. My second deployment, I went with one hearing aid in my, my right ear. By the second deployment, they said I would need a second one, and you can't stay in if you need two hearing aids. So um, I fought and fought and tried. And as I'm getting, realizing that I'm going to get medically discharged, I, I'm like, Mom, you love the Coca-Cola Museum, which is in Atlanta, Georgia, not too far from where we're at. Let's do a trip where Josh and Ashley and, you know, we, we can do a trip before I move back home. And uh, so a couple weeks before that, my brother calls me. And he says, uh, I had to take mom to the emergency room. People go to the emergency room, right? Like, it's not, it's not a huge deal. Um, and then he calls me, and he's like, hey, I brought her home. The next morning, he calls me, and he's like, hey, I brought her back. And uh, on January 15, 2007, my brother called me to tell me that my mom was gone. And I, some of these moments in your life, you remember exactly where you were. I don't know what conversation my brother and I exchanged at that moment, but I know that I, that I hit the ground in my little kitchen, and I didn't know how I was going to get back up in that exact moment. I, I don't know how long I was actually down, and, uh, and so from that point on, uh, I've looked at moms a little differently. Um, some things I didn't share last service is I know that that God does things in our lives for a purpose, and, and me being able to, to go through such a hardship of losing my mom, um, she was 44 um, at a young age, I'm able to relate with so many people when they're going through losses or hard times. 
and I, I'm not saying I count it as a blessing that my mom passed away, but that, that's part of it that I can look at as a blessing. And so I know we do go through hard times, but, but it's something that, that my mom can still share with me today. When someone loses someone close to them, I can remember my mom and remember how to, to help with that. And so as I go through these lasting lessons that my mom gave me, that's one of them that I forgot to share last service. Uh, the next one is I remember the last time I spoke with my mom. I was driving from uh, Savannah, Georgia, back to Hinesville. And uh, it was about a 45-minute drive. I was in my, uh, uh, I had this little orange Jeep uh, Wrangler. And I was talking to her on the phone, and we're discussing plans. I had just gotten this awesome hotel in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, with floor-to-ceiling windows that overlooked the Coca-Cola Museum. And my mom loved Coke, not the drug. She loved Coca-Cola. And we'd been to the factory before, and, like, it's one of our favorite memories, going to the Coca-Cola Museum. And, uh, and, and so I was really excited that I got, I even got the, the windows facing the Coca-Cola Museum in this, fl- awesome. And so I was telling her about it, and I'm like, listen, I'm driving, I'm going to call you when I get home, or we'll talk a little bit later, you know, you're going to be here soon, whatever. And so I'm getting ready to hang up, and she says, hey, I love you. I said, I love you too, Duh. You know, like, of course I do. Always, 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 with people close to you, say I love you. If you love someone, not if you're mad at someone, don't say it. When you love someone, let them know every chance you get. And I think my mom's part of the reason I like hugs, because that's that's added. If, if you're on the phone, you can say I love you, but if you're in person, show it. Show it, too. Don't just say it. And so as we go to the next lesson, let me, let me work on this here. Um, my mom was, was late for everything in her life except for death. <laughs> I made the joke at, at, at her funeral. You know, wow, you've been early for one thing. Um, but the, the, the point that she used to always make to me was not, it's so important to be on time. And I still struggle with always wanting to be early and on time and, 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 and just struggle. Like, that's my thing. Like, you've got to be on time. You gotta, and it's part military, you know, whatever. But my mom used to tell me that it's not about when you show up. It's that you actually show up somewhere. Right? So you can show up late, but, but make sure you're focused on the people you're with. She was so surrounded by people and she knew it and so she she shared that love and it wasn't about the time it was just what you did with it and then unconditional love (laughs) the biggest part of my notes I have here um, was not a very good kid ask my brother he'll tell you way better than me how good of a kid I was how bad of a kid I was Um, so I made a list of some some of the bigger things these are by this is not a complete list I stole my grandpa's cop car three times. I was caught once. They called it joyriding, so I got in less trouble. Um, It's a government vehicle. (laughs) Uh, While on probation with that, I stole my mother's car. And she did press charges. Um, But honestly, that's unconditional love. That really is. Uh, I hated her in the moment, but thank her for it today. Uh, I've, I had a couple minor in possessions. Belgrade, Montana, it's not as small now, but when I was, there was no stoplights when I was going there, so every cop knew me. Um, they'd see me smoking in my car, they'd pull me over and also give me tra- traffic tickets. But uh, multiple speeding tickets, uh, three no insurance tickets, two for no registration, lots of partying, lots of uh, throwing stuff. I used to smoke in the bathroom. Um, every time we'd get in a fight, I'd think I'd find something new to throw at my mother. Or my brother. Uh, we were just sharing the other day, my brother and I, uh, uh, the holes in the wall at 804 Golden West Drive, the, the nice house that my single mom had bought for us. Uh, when we would get in a fight, he said there was one he remembers where he's sitting inside his room blocking the door, like sitting against the door, and my fist came through right next to his head. Um, now, these are not solid wood doors, okay? I'm not, you know, some kind of ninja. Uh, they were pretty cheap doors, but uh, we used to, like... If, put posters up and move doors all around the house so that we could hide how many holes were actually in them. My mom didn't know until she tried to sell the house of all the holes. <laughs> but she still loved me, despite how bad of a kid I was. Romans 13, 
one. It's a weird Mother's Day verse, but this is the one I want to share with y'all. Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Moms, raise your hand. You can put your hand down. No, 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 no. Keep them up. You can put them down if you think that you are not an authority. Thank you. So this is why it's a Mother's Day. You can now put them down. <laughs> this, is, this is why I think it's a Mother's Day verse, because our children are ours for only a short time. Our children are God's for eternity if we do our job right. Our children are ours for only a short period of time. And so when, when, when you look at this verse here, and those in positions of authority, moms have been placed there by God. I want everyone in this room to understand that the mother that you have and the mother that you are, the mother that you know, God, when he created the universe, knew what children you would have. He lined you up, even if it was me as a kid, he lined my mom up, unfortunately, with me. (laughs) But he knew that she could handle me. And so I want every woman in this room that can be a mother, is a mother, is a grandmother, great-grandmother, is an aunt, is in a motherly position to understand that you are there and it's from the creation of the universe that God placed you there. It was not an accident. I I hope that we can wake up each day and understand how important that is. If he did not want you to be the mother anymore, he would do what I call zapping you. You're no longer the mother. So every day you wake up a mother, understand that God wants you to still be a mother. After seeing my wife raise children, you get a different perspective. I love my wife to death. She's gone, as I told you, uh, for 10 agonizing days. I, people around me act like I have cancer right now. Like, do you need food? <laughs> Are you sleeping okay? Like, we're going to come by, we'll mow the lawn for you, you know? <laughs> like, I love it, please. I, I love it because my wife does really, I think it's actually worse when my wife leaves because she does so much and she's awesome. I hope you're watching. Um, <laughs> but we don't all get blessed as, as my children have with a godly mother. Uh, before my mom died, I do know that, that she, she knew Jesus. Uh, but as we were growing up, we didn't have much Jesus. And so the, the dynamic of today is that uh, Pastor Josh gets to share growing up with a mom that knows Jesus. I started out the first service by saying, I love you, I love you, all you guys, I love you moms. I love, 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 love because he loves me. I love you. And it's just an awesome thing to to grasp and understand God's love that he has for each and every one of us. My mom, my mother, my mommy, my godly mother. um, I wrote a couple things down for uh, characteristics of what I I think. And sorry, are you starting? (laughs) What I think of my mother. uh, Loving, caring, Steadfast, strong, wise, hardworking, example. She's a provider. She's a nurturer. She's a prayer warrior. And she's an encourager. My mother, as a baby, do not want to leave their side. As a child, she is there to comfort you when you cry. As a teen, she was my prayer. She was my guiding light. As a young man, she was my encouragement. As a husband with a wife and kids, she is now grandma. And now, the love pours out on my children. My mother, Proverbs 31, says this. 
The sayings of King Lemuel contain this message which his mother taught him. O my son, O son of my womb, O son of my vows, do not waste your strength on women on those who ruin kings. <clears throat> it is not for kings, O Lemuel, to guzzle wine rulers should not crave alcohol. For if they drink, they may forget the law and not give justice to the oppressed. Alcohol is for the dying and wine for those in bitter distress. Let them drink to forget their poverty and remember their troubles no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, ensure justice for those being crushed. You speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She is more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her and she will greatly enrich his life. <clears throat> she brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She is like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household and plan the day's work for her servant girls. She goes to inspect a field and buys it. With her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She's an energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread, her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. She makes her own bedspreads. She dresses in fine linen and purple gowns. Her husband is well known at the city gates, where he sits with the other civic leaders. She makes belt, belted linen garments and sashes to sell at the merchants. She is clothed with strength and digni dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. She care carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her child children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, deceptive, and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done, and let her deeds publicly declare her praise. My mother, loved, caring, steadfast, strong, wise, hardworking, example, provider, nurturer, prayer, encourager, Proverbs 31, woman, a woman that all women should aspire to be, a woman that all men should try to find, a woman that my mother was, and I believe a woman that my wife is. Mothers... <clears throat> To be a mother, to be a mom, to be a mommy. Um, as Brian talked about his wife, Lindsay, I talk about my, my wife kind of in the same manner. You, you, you look at it from a different perspective. When you have these things growing up, you really don't realize it. But when you become a, a young man or a young woman, you look back and more than likely your vision is 20-20 when you look behind yourself and you, and you realize what you had. So I realized what I had as a mom, for a mom, as a godly mother to me, who uh, helped me set the foundation for my life. I see that in my wife, Tiffany, who is doing that for my two boys. And it's a beautiful thing to watch. It's a beautiful thing to see a mom be a godly mom. Obviously, there can be mothers that don't believe in God and still are caring, still are loving, still have patience, but it's the purpose and it's the thing that sets a godly mother apart is the example of love, who they follow, who is then portrayed to their children. And we go to Ephesians 3.8. 3.18 says this, It says, 
And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. And then it goes on to 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8. It says this. It says, If I could speak all the languages of the earth and, uh, and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all, all God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I'd be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud <clears throat> or rude. It does not demand its own way is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Lord, love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. And lastly, prophecy and speaking in unknown, unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Love. As a godly mother, it's it's, it's your job, it's your, your, your duty to, to fill yourself up with God's love, to understand the love that Jesus gave to us by dying on the cross for us, by taking upon our sins. It's that love, is when you grasp that love and understand that love and are able to, to express it to your children, to pour it upon your children. That is the love, and I said this, it says, I said, mothers are kingdom builders laying the foundation for which Jesus is, is to build upon. It's, it's our job, not just as mothers, but as fathers too, but to use these early years when children are moldable and they can, they see everything that we do to express the love of Jesus to them through you so that when they become of age, they will, Jesus will have a foundation to build upon. It says in Proverbs 22, verse 6, it says this, it says, direct your children to the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. Mothers, grasping the love of Jesus is your number one duty. Once you grasp the love of Jesus, it will change your life. And by changing your life, it will change your children's life and your family's life. It's that simple. Grasping his love his, his mercy, his grace, the love that never fails, that we can't express how, how high, how wide, how deep, how long it is, because it's never ending. His love for us, his love for you is amazing. It's like trying to, trying to take a little cup and going to Niagara Falls and trying to put all that water in your little cup. It ain't going to happen, because that's just how much his love for you is. And if, and if as mothers... As godly mothers, you can take it upon yourself to fill yourself up with God's love and express it to your children and be, be kingdom builders. And that's, I guess, my call to you. And just realize that. You, know, just, you are important. Mothers, whether you work full-time as a secular job, and still have kids. You're, you're always on full time. You're always on duty, right? That never changes. But your job as a mom, as a mother, far exceeds anything else in your life. I, 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 guess, I guess I could keep on saying that, but I won't. But it's just, it's that important. My mother was that important. My wife's being a mother, my wife being a mother to my kids is that important. I make it a priority that she has what she needs so that she can, do, she can do what she does as a mother. I love you, and what we're going to do now is Brian's going to come up, and we're going to invite all the mothers to come up on stage. Sorry. All right, let's uh, bow our heads, close our eyes, and say a blessing over the mothers. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your heart. We thank you for the hearts that you have given our mothers of patience, kindness, peace, and grace. We ask that you protect all of us as we go throughout our life, that you put a, put a, a blessing upon us, dear Lord, and, and especially on the mothers as they do your work. We pray that uh, 
we uh, were a light for you, that we're the salt of the earth, and that you can just guide and direct us as we go. We love you, we love you, we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen. All right, you guys have a wonderful week.